Nathaniel Abraham was just 11 years old when he found himself in the middle of one of the most controversial murder cases in the history of the United States of America. The case scandalized the country and almost everyone responded with outrage. A murder case. But the folks on Nathaniel's block, his own neighbors, well, they weren't particularly shocked. He might have been little, measuring no more than four feet and weighing a little under 65 pounds, but he was also a thorn in the side of everyone in the neighborhood, a danger to the community. He threatened my grandsons all the time. He threw rocks at my mom's house. I mean, he was dangerous. And she wasn't alone. Another neighbor, an 11 year old girl, shared a similar sentiment because according to her, when they were both nine, Nate had threatened her with a gun. So as Nathaniel Abraham's murder case began to take its hold in the center of public consciousness, it became clear that his entire block had turned against him. As disturbing as these allegations sounded, it seemed like they were true. All of his neighbors wanted him locked up, except one. Only one neighbor on Nate's block came to his defense when the cameras started rolling. He didn't try to downplay or dismiss claims about the boy. I think that that's crazy for him to be charged as an adult. He was only 11 years old. This neighbor was convinced that the little boy wasn't the devil. He was just a broken child who made terrible decisions. This man had also experienced a version of Nate that his neighbors hadn't got the chance to see. He wanted the government and the prosecutors to go easy on the young boy. Why? Because Nathaniel Abraham was an 11 year old boy charged with the murder of an 18 year old named Ronnie Green. Because in the most controversial turn of events, the state of Michigan was willing and ready to try him as an adult due to the severity of his crime. And if they found him guilty, if the prosecutors were able to get what they wanted, little Nate would spend the rest of his life in prison for a crime he committed when he was just 11. Some of you watching would say murder is murder regardless of the age. That's what makes the intricacies of this story all the more interesting. Let me set the record straight before we dive into this case. The true victim in this story was 18-year-old Ronnie Green. Nate was a preteen who killed a teenager and now he had to face the consequences. So what went wrong? We have to trace the thread back to the very beginning. Pontiac, Michigan, 1986. Months after he was born, his father left and never returned. This sudden change resulted in incredible hardship for the family because Nate wasn't the only child. There were six of them. His mother Gloria was forced to take up two jobs to keep their family afloat. She had to work day and night, so she was never around. And Nate's formative years were spent under the care of his older siblings. Gloria was caught between a rock and a hard place, between spending time raising her children or working hard to ensure they didn't starve to death. It's no easy dilemma. However, this whole situation turned out to be the perfect storm for something dark within Nate. With no one to keep him in check, Nate became delinquent. From the moment he could walk, he began to exhibit extremely antisocial behavior. Many kids show these traits when they are young. Parents corrected and rooted out. But no one was around to do that for Nate. So it grew into something so ugly that by the time that he was nine, he had become a troublesome child with a rap sheet of a serious middle-aged criminal. From the age of nine till 11, Nate had 22 police encounters, some for arson, a couple of others for assault, and several for breaking and entering. Out of those 22, at least five involved the use of a weapon. One involved a 14-year-old that he beat with a steel pipe, and the last involved an adult, a bus driver. At some point, he became such a problem in the neighborhood that the prosecutors would later reveal in court that a neighbor moved out of the block because of him. That same neighbor would also say, quite prophetically, that someday Nate was going to kill somebody. Now, you are probably wondering what Nate's mother did during this period. At some point, she began to feel helpless when almost every day there was someone knocking on their door reporting Nate's latest crime. One major reason why she felt helpless was because that she had actually gone to the police for help. She wanted them to intervene in her son's situation, but they referred her to the juvenile court. And when she got there, they sent her back to the police, telling her that her word wasn't enough. No one was prepared to help. Nobody was ready to intervene. Now, remember when I said Nate was born into a perfect storm? There was one more piece left for the chaotic future he was now destined to have. The 1980s was a very interesting decade in American history. 
Ronald Reagan became president. CNN became a thing. There were those interesting looking Macintosh computers. And then there was violence, widespread violence in major cities like New York and Chicago. However, the most troubling part of the 1980s was the spike in the level of violent crimes committed by juveniles. Between 1980 and 1994, the number of juvenile homicide offenders doubled. And according to FBI clearance statistics from that time frame, the juvenile responsibility for all homicides in the country grew from 5% to 10%. The quick answer to why this was happening was the crack epidemic of the mid-1980s. In the inner cities, it had become a plague, and it wasn't long before those drugs got paired with guns and juveniles. Now, the progression from drug trade to gun violence isn't surprising. In fact, many would agree it's natural and expected. But how did kids get into the mix? Well, drug traffickers at the time found that children and teenagers made excellent recruits, better than adults. Children worked as low-level sellers, carriers, and lookouts, while working for less, taking greater risks, and escaping detention. Because at the time, no one would have guessed that an 11-year-old standing on a street corner was a drug dealer. And even when these kids got caught, their age implied innocence, and it meant that they escaped punishment. From the drug dealer's perspective, these juveniles were beyond perfect. So it wasn't long before these same juveniles came in contact with guns and began using them for their own protection, even if they didn't need to. They aspired to use them because guns had become a status symbol for the drug dealing lifestyle that these kids now wanted to be a part of. And that's why just a decade earlier in 1976, records showed that less than two thirds of juvenile homicide offenders used a gun. And by 1994, 82% of juveniles used a gun in cases of homicide. This was the background of Nate's childhood. And while there is no record of drug dealing activity on his juvenile record, it wouldn't be wild to suggest that he found himself in that crowd. And that it was that crowd that enabled his truancy. Where else do you think he got the gun he used? His mother didn't own a gun. Now, as expected, the government's response to this spike of violent, gun-fueled juvenile delinquency was to turn to the law. So, as the 1980s progressed, a growing number of states passed laws stipulating that kids under 17 could be tried as adults for certain crimes. It was a weird way to deal with the problem because they weren't seeking direct solutions. They were just adding to the punishment. Supporters of this law who happened to be civilians like you and me took to the streets waving banners and slogans that read adult crime, adult time. And by 1992, more than 40 states had passed laws for trying children as adults. But no state's version of the juvenile justice law matched the severity of Michigan's. Michigan, the same state that Nathaniel Abraham was born in, raised in, and would commit his devastating crime in, set no limits on the age that a child could be tried as an adult. They called their law, Get Tough on Juvenile Offenders. In fact, when one of the state senators who pushed for this law was asked if a child as young as four could be tried as an adult, his answer was a resounding yes. The stage was now set for Nathaniel Abraham's crime. And three years after that law was passed in 1997, when 11-year-old Nathaniel Abraham shot 18-year-old Ronnie Green, he became the scapegoat of a law that set the scene for the country's most controversial juvenile murder trial to date. On the 31st of October, 1997, there was a commotion in Lincoln Middle School. There were police officers in the sixth grade class, and they were reading their rights. Not to the class teacher, but to 11-year-old Nathaniel Abraham, dressed up in a Halloween costume. A day before, on the 30th of October, 1997, an 18-year-old boy named Ronnie Green had passed away after fighting for his life for almost 24 hours. He had been shot in the head by a single bullet from a 22 caliber rifle. As investigators scrambled to find out who this killer was, they discovered that on the day before, 11-year-old Nathaniel Abraham had stolen a 22 caliber rifle and gone shooting outside. He shot at a neighbor's house first, narrowly missing the man who owned the house. And moments later, he stood in a cluster of trees about 200 feet away from a convenience store, took aim and fired a bullet that would hit 18-year-old Ronnie Green in the head and kill him roughly a day later. While Nate admitted that he was the one who shot Ronnie, he denied targeting him. 
Instead, he claimed that he was only aiming for light bulbs and trees. The shot that killed Ronnie Green was, by his own admission, an unfortunate error. The prosecutors weren't buying it. Despite the fact that the 11-year-old boy had never met Ronnie Green before the shooting, they were convinced that he had deliberately set out to kill someone that day. If you're wondering what fueled the prosecutor's conviction, well, they had evidence that Nate had spoken to his girlfriend, saying that he was going to kill someone on the morning of Ronnie Green's tragic demise. And that, after the shooting, he had bragged about the kill he made to his friends. With the backing of Michigan's Get Tough on Juvenile Offenders law, the prosecutors received permission to try Nate as an adult, charging him with first-degree murder and several other felonies. Nate was arrested, placed in handcuffs, and he was sent to Oakland County Children's Village, a juvenile detention center in Michigan while he awaited trial. The arrest was deeply controversial. Controversial enough to deeply divide the country along several ethical lines. While there were many unwilling to contribute to the discussion, there were many more who thought that this was a fitting punishment for the 11-year-old Nate. There was an overwhelming majority, especially in the black community, who were against the decision. Amnesty International, Reverend Al Sharpton, and probably every major civil rights activist in the country protested against the whole affair, calling it a disgrace to the justice system that should protect children delinquent or not. Like I noted earlier, they were trying to try him as an adult, and if he was found guilty, he would be sent to prison for the rest of his life. One lawyer was outraged enough by the case that he chose to take it on pro bono, at no cost to Nate's family. This lawyer was named Jeffrey Figer. He was a lawyer who, up to that point, had built a reputation for taking on most cases that lawyers wouldn't touch. His most infamous past client at that time was a man named Jack Kevorkian, also known as Dr. Death. Jack Kevorkian was an actual doctor with the rap sheet of a comic book villain. On his rap sheet, the man had advocated harvesting the organs from death row inmates. While he was a pathologist, he experimented with transfusing blood from the recently deceased into live patients. He did a lot of bizarre, unethical things throughout his career as a doctor, but the most controversial one the one that got Joffrey Figer representing him as his attorney in court, involved assisted suicide in Michigan. Kevorkian's story is worthy of its own video, so I won't go down that rabbit hole. Just know that while Nate's situation was controversial, it was not new to Jeffrey Figer. And immediately he took on Nate's case. He began a series of motions and appeals that delayed the trial for at least two more years, enough time for him to prepare. On the 29th of October, 1999, the murder trial began. Nate's first appearance in court looked like something from a really dark SNL sketch. He was dressed in oversized prison garb. There were cuffs on his wrists and chains on his feet. When he was asked to raise his right hand, he raised his left. Halfway through the hearings, he would start sobbing, and for most of the trial, he looked lost. But prosecutors and the politicians who supported this law were hell-bent on seeing it through to the end. I'm gonna shoot somebody. In her opening statement, the prosecutor, Lisa Haluska, dramatically wrote down those words for the jury to read. She claimed that these were the words that 11-year-old Nate told his girlfriend days before the killing. As the trial progressed, this prosecutor called witnesses who supported the idea that Nathaniel's act was, in fact, a premeditated murder. According to the witnesses, he had stolen the rusty rifle he used, then practiced target shooting at balloons and the houses of his neighbors before the fatal shooting of Ronnie Green. Later, the prosecutor would also note that Nate had told the police contradicting stories about the shooting, which, according to her, was proof that he knew what he had done and that it was wrong. When it was Joffrey Figa's turn, he argued that the shooting was an unfortunate accident. He didn't dispute the fact that Nathaniel fired the gun, but he insisted that the boy was not trying to hit anyone. Figa brought an expert marksman to stand as a witness who testified that it would have been almost impossible to deliberately hit a small target from more than 200 feet, which was the approximate distance Nate was from the victim. And it was even more unlikely because the rifle he used was old and battered. Later, Figa called on child psychologists to describe Nathaniel's mental state. According to these experts, Nate had an IQ of 70, 
And at the time of the murder, his thought process were like those of a six-year-old. Feige tried to prove that Nathaniel lacked impulse control and the mental capacity to form the intent to kill. However, the prosecution brought their own psychologist to the stand as a witness, and he rebutted the claim that Nate couldn't form an intent to kill. Nate's case was a delicate one. If you were in front of the family of the deceased, how could you say your son's killer was just a child? In a way, there was something odd about the entire premise of the case because if Nate had been a 30-year-old man who was examined by a court psychologist and determined to have the mental capacity of a six-year-old, would a 30-year-old Nate still be tried? But wait a minute, the plot thickens because the Constitution also stipulates that Nate be tried by a jury of his peers. And we both know that there is no way the court was going to do a pre-teen jury selection in an elementary school. So the jury that was hearing Nate's case were all adults. There were constitutional gaps that this murder trial allowed. When a journalist confronted the prosecution about it, they argued that the adult nature of Nate's crime and the severity of the consequences of his crime on the victim's family was what justified the jury of adults. At the end of the day, the truth was, even though two years had passed since he committed the crime and Nathaniel Abraham was now 13, he was still too young to drive a car, too young to drink, too young to vote. And as a direct consequence of this, people still argue that he should have been too young to be tried as an adult. In the final days of the trial, the prosecutors began seeking a compromise. No more first degree murder charges. Now they were asking the presiding judge on Nate's behalf to allow the jury to consider a lesser offense. Whether this was out of goodwill or because there was no victory in sending an 11 year old to life behind bars, but no one knows. What we do know is that it worked, and on the 16th of November 1999, Nate was found guilty of second degree murder, which still made him the youngest American to be ever convicted of murder as an adult. And there were three options on the table for the judge. The first was the harshest, a prison term of eight to 25 years. The second option was more moderate, blended sentence, and it would see Nate go to a juvenile detention center. By the time he turned 18, if he was properly rehabilitated, he would be released. If not, he would be transferred to an adult prison after turning 21 to serve the rest of his 25 year sentence. This was what the prosecutors wanted. This is what they pushed for, but it wasn't what the judge eventually chose. To their surprise, the judge went for the third option, which was the most lenient. Nate would be sent to a juvenile detention center and he would stay there till he was 21 after which he would become a free man. And at the age of 13, Nathaniel Abraham began what was supposedly a long road of rehabilitation. The state had less than eight years to rehabilitate Nate. Would they succeed? On the 13th of January 2000, Nate was placed in the care of the Michigan Department of Human Services for treatment and rehabilitation. Then he was moved to Maxie Boys Training School. And to everyone's surprise, by August of that very year, he began to show signs of responsibility. Throughout 2001, he passed all of his classes and he was praised for his academic performance in math, reading, and note keeping. By 2003, Nate was described as a leader within his group. He displayed a positive attitude, took on additional work, and followed directions. At this point, his supervisors decided it was time to get him to work in the real world. So at the age of 17, Nate began working in a Goodwill store. And before long, his employers at the store indicated that he displayed good communication skills and that he was courteous with the customers. Eventually on the 18th of December and at the age of 18, Nathaniel earned his GED. The following year, he would earn his high school diploma and eventually he was just one year away from his release. So, was Nate rehabilitated? Had the juvenile system succeeded in transforming the 11-year-old killer into a functioning member of society? He had shown constant progress through the years and the world was about to find out if they had succeeded. If you noticed, the reports I relayed to you felt a little bit too clean, too sugary, something was off. Well, you can blame me for that because I deliberately omitted some details. Nate had an anger issue. To be quite frank, he had a lot of issues. 
enough of them to require several disciplinary actions taken against him. Nate had an affinity for getting into fights, even though he never really started them. He had a pattern of yelling at prison staff. During basketball games or any competitive sports, Nate had the tendency to get heated. He also had sticky fingers and had been caught more than once stealing cleaning supplies to give to his girlfriend. Again, most of these missteps were seen as just that, missteps, normal for any youth. What mattered was that he no longer participated in the crimes he had committed when he was nine. Remember, larceny, malicious destruction of property, assault and illegal entry, murder? Nathaniel Abraham hadn't killed anyone in the eight years since the trial. So on the 18th of January 2007, after spending nearly a decade in juvenile detention, Nate was free, released into society. He was a free man. I wish this was the end of the story, and I wish I could wrap it up here with some Disney-esque happily ever after. But unfortunately, there were more issues ahead for Nate. For the first 18 months of his newfound freedom, nothing remotely criminal or remarkable happened to Nate. Unfortunately, in May of 2008, Nate was arrested again in Pontiac with 254 ecstasy pills in a liquor bottle bag. He was sentenced to four to 20 years in prison, but eventually got paroled in June 2017. Did the rehabilitation fail or was this just another misstep that Nate would learn from? Well, consider this. After he was discharged from parole in July of 2018, on the 6th of August of that same year, Nate got into more trouble with the police after he exposed himself in front of a 46-year-old neighbor who had declined his offer to cut her lawn. Two days after that incident, he struck deputies who tried to take him into custody for skipping a court appearance. He was charged with resisting and obstructing police, a felony punishable by up to four years in prison. Had the system failed Nate, or was this his own doing? or better still, undoing. In 2019, Nate, who is now 33, was handed a six to 40 year prison sentence for selling drugs to an undercover police officer in Farmington Hills. Before the sentence, he had pleaded guilty and shown remorse for his actions. This was probably the reason why the judge had been extremely lenient when sentencing him, because under normal circumstances, he would have had to face another life sentence because of his frequent problems with the law. Nate wasn't alone in court on the day of his sentencing. His mother, siblings, and every relative that had been by his side since the start of his troubling journey with the law almost 20 years before was present. And when the cameras turned to his mother, when the questions about the support she had for her son came up, Gloria Abraham was unwavering. Nothing had changed on her end. I believe in my son, she said. And of course, society doesn't know his life. He will do okay. He's a strong young man. Thanks for tuning in to Twisted Minds. That was the case of Nathaniel Abraham. And why don't you go ahead and click on one of the two videos on your screen for another one of our videos.